may be stretching. Uh, the, I really the think we're stretching here. it. I really think that we're stretching it well, we, way yes, too far. That's a very philosophical question. And that's we, we did this too. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris debate whether playing a video game can be considered an act of creative expression. Plus, impressions of Machi Koro and looks ahead to Jalopy and Civilization VI. BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 77 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Howdy. And we're joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And Doc, how about you introduce our uh, topic for today? Oh, this is a juicy one. The question is, is playing a video game a creative act? And there's actually some... mm, Yes. No. Wait. Yes. No. Let's call it research. Um, There's some research to back this up. And uh, we're going to get into it. And, and it comes from the, the highest of all authorities on all things true. That hmm. would be the Smithsonian Institute. So they can't, Oh, I was going to say, nobody right. asked me. So I'm <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Well, that's why we're asking you right now, Jim. <laughs> oh, okay. Here well, on the there we go, then. Perfect. The truth will be revealed once and for all. That's right. Perfect. That's right. But first, we have some opening segments for you, including Table Talk. Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. So, so how do we pronounce this, the name of this game, Doc? Because I, I love saying it already, and I've not even played it. Machikoro. 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 Well, keep in mind, um, even though it is a city-building game about a small town in Japan, mm. it's actually out of San Francisco, and so these are American guys, and uh, we can go ahead and Americanize it and just say Machikoro. <laughs> well, that's not Americanizing. That's like Texas. Texasizing. Like, Texas okay. Ma- Machi Machikoro. Mm. Ma- Ma- Machikoro. No. Actually, I think Machikoro? if it was te- Machi- Machikoro, yeah, I think if it was Texas size, the cards would be like the size of this table. Oh, yeah, well, that's one. true too. Regardless, uh, Machikoro is the name of this card game, and it's an excellent card game. Uh, it's worth mentioning now, even though it's been out for a little while, because it has just come out with its call it deluxe edition. It mm. Comes in a in a tin, which is always exciting when a game comes in a tin, because then you have to put a rubber band around it in order to keep all the, the bits in. Um, but Really, what's interesting is you can now buy all of the expansions and the core game for less than the price of the various expansions and core game. Uh, the whole thing's about 45 bucks. Mm. but what I really want to talk about is the mechanics of the game itself. Now, there's, uh, there's sort of a classic, uh, let's call it vilification, if you will, of games that have a die mechanic, especially when you roll 2d6 and it's it's kind of random and, and that, you know, it's like Settlers of Catan kind mm-hmm. of things, what I'm talking about here. So, whenever I first started this game, I didn't think I was going to like it. I went, oh no, it's just a Settlers knockoff. Turns out it's not. For, for starters, the game understands fundamentally at a mechanic level that you can roll 1d6 or you can upgrade and choose to roll 2d6 or not roll 2d6 Hmm. and that in and of itself right there brings in the idea of linear probability and the idea of uh non-linear in other words uh, a bell curve probability Mm -hmm. boom right there and you have control over that at you know at all times so that's the first thing. How, uh, long, how long do they give you to make your choice? Oh, well, as, as long as you want. I mean, it's basically once you make the upgrade, you uh-huh. can you can go back and forth and choose, I'm going to roll two right now, I'm going to roll one right now. It's always an option. Hmm. It's, it's a you may kind of a statement, okay? So that's the first thing is that you can, you can make that, you choose when to make that upgrade and then you choose whether or not to use the upgrade once you've made it. Ultimately, this is what happens whenever you buy cards and put them in front of you. You kind of start with three cards, and you have these um, uh, various upgrades that you're trying to, to get out in front of you. With all the expansions and stuff, it's like nine of them. When the first person to do all nine buildings wins. That's that's the victory condition. Um, but what, the way that it works is you buy buildings, and you put them in your town, and you put those in front of you. And all of them have a number, like mm. a, a die value on them. And some of them are low, like a four or a three 
or a 2 to 3, like a range, and others of them are really high, like a 12 to 14. 14, you say? How would you roll that on a 2d6? I'm glad you asked. Uh, and and the, the answer is that there's another upgrade that you can buy, and it adds, if you get 10 or more, 2 to your roll. See? So you see where this is going. Mm. You can choose which upgrades to the die, what modifiers you want, and that kind of a thing. There's three types of cards that really you want to get. Uh, the first is the kind of card that activates on your turn. You roll the dice, you, you roll the number that you've got in front of you, and boom, a cool thing happens. Usually it's get money. The second type is the type that activates when anybody else, uh, like including you, anybody at all on the table, uh, rolls that number. Oh, I like those. Yeah, those cool, are huh? And then the third type is whenever somebody else, not you, does it, and usually where you're getting mm. the money from is them in other words, they have to pay you. So, <laughs> oh, like, you've got a cafe or you've got a, a sushi restaurant, something like that. It's like, all right, I rolled a thing. I'm going to get money. Oh, but before you do, you got to pay me because you just came to my sushi restaurant. So See it's kind of almost like a monopoly kind of influence. There. Yes. And what I love about it is everybody is paying attention to everyone else at all times. Hmm. Because if you aren't paying attention, you might miss. That guy just rolled a six. A six triggers something you have. That's really, really cool. The game understands sort of in a mathematical way, it's very well designed, if you will, uh, that seven is the most probable number that you're going to get, and that, that sixes and eights are, are slightly less probable, and then as you get out towards, you know, twos and twelves, and so on and so forth, those are going to be extremely rare. So when those things trigger, something monumental happens. Like, um, it's the private club, and it costs you, you know, 14 to build, and you have to... Uh, when it, uh, whenever it rolls, you know you, you get to take that person's all, like all their money. So if they roll a twelve, you get to take all their money. And it's it's just it's really great. You feel the economy in action, and there's heavy heavy strategy in it, even though it's still terribly random. And as I've played this game now three or four times, mm. uh, I tell you, I've, I keep rolling that stupid five. I just keep rolling the five. <laughs> just keep rolling the five. I can roll two d six. Boom, still rolling the five. And the five is like this dead zone. And so I had nothing for, for the fives, and I'm just ripping my hair out, and other people are, like, rolling 11s and 12s just repeatedly mm. and getting their, their tuna boats to come in. And I'm just like, yeah, and they're millionaires. And then, then I buy the park. And the park, whenever the park gets rolled, uh, takes all the money, puts it in the middle, and distributes it evenly. <laughs> so, because, you know, communism. Mm. Uh, but anyway, the, the great thing about it is that there's a base game that's very simple. There's, a, uh, I think, four expansions now that come in that Deluxe 10, uh, which make it a lot more complex. You can really tailor the game to what you want it to be. Uh, Machi Koro is the name of it. Highly, highly recommend it, especially for game nights. I think that it has that perfect mix of mm. strategy and random uh, especially if you got like kids, I think I think it's a good game uh, for adults and kids to to mix together. So, so a couple questions before we move on. So, how many people can play this at once? Five, five people. Mm -hmm. And also, how long does a typical session take? Well, we played with all the expansions, so we were playing for about two hours. Mm -hmm. But typically, a base game, which has a lot fewer than those nine things you're supposed to build, I think it's like three or four, mm -hmm. uh, would take somewhere in the neighborhood of forty five minutes to an hour. So it's kind of comparable to Catan, or actually shorter than Catan, it sounds. Quite a bit. In fact, I, I can't stand Catan. Um, no, I'm not really a fan so of it either. So for me to say that I really like a game that has that 2D6 mechanic built into it, please understand. I really think they knew what it was, and they worked around it, and they fixed it. Hmm. And I still haven't won, so um, that's probably the biggest thing. Is that mm -hmm. I've played this game three or four times, and I have not won it, and I've had so much fun losing every single time. Now it's time for Let's Watch Let's Plays, the part of our show about games, about shows about games. So a couple weeks ago we had a nice long discussion about No Man's Sky, and we talked about a lot of the things we thought didn't really work so well in that game for the exploration. Um, and as I've sort of been seeing people react to um, just the game in general, I've been observing that people who tend to be more positive about it are the ones who kind of accept that it is essentially just a if you will, almost like a road trip. You're just going from this planet you start on, you're trying to get to the center, and along the way you're just going to see some nice pretty things. Um, but that got me thinking about a game that I heard about a little while back called Jalopy. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and read you real quick the, uh, the little tagline that they had on their Steam page. Before you do, I love that metaphor. Mm -hmm. uh, the road trip metaphor. It's like, yeah, road trip in space. <laughs> no, there you go. I, I like that too. Um, go ahead. So the way they sort of pitch it is uh, build, repair, refuel, and drive a dilapidated old car on a grand journey through the territories of the former Eastern Bloc. Oh, gee. 
that does not that does not sound fun. And this, um, and this was something that um, I know just before the show started, mm-hmm. we we went through and we watched um, a let's play of. Did he say it was a pre-alpha? Pre-alpha yeah. Early yeah. version. Yeah, it's currently available in early access. Um, so far on Steam, it's actually been getting very positive user reviews. Eighty-five uh, percent uh, say that it's it's been very good. That's amazing for a pre-alpha. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, you might be getting a little bit of bias in the sense that the types of people who'd be interested in a game like this are going to gravitate toward mm-hmm. it, while a bunch of people are probably not going to. Also, a lot of the sort of p- person that's willing to play a pre-alpha is going to probably understand mm. that they need to kind of be pretty forgiving. I yeah. think you just cracked the internet code right there, Chris. <laughs> um, but what's interesting about this to me is that it's procedurally generated. Each time you take a trip, it's going to be a little bit different, um, which means that each time you play, there's going to be kind of a fresh, new experience. It's not like going through and just replaying the same linear experience multiple times. Do, do we know how um, extensively that, that it, the procedural generation is? Is it just the roads themselves is it like placement of for example hotels and shops or does everything about the hotels and shops change I'm yeah, the doorknob it's, positions no, let's let's not, let's, I, I don't, I I don't hope know it's the former and they don't go just try I, to go crazy i have a it. feeling it's more of the former yeah. um they mentioned things for instance, like, right? like yeah um, i would say so finding things on the side of the road um, oh stuff like that yeah. yeah yeah um and then i'm sure like the the shape of the roads and again like you said the placement of certain buildings mm-hmm. what intrigues me about this though is that no man's sky tried to pack or tried to put this sort of extra layer of survival onto it and you start off with a broken ship you have to fix and get up into space but then after that for the most part the only time you have to worry about things breaking down is when maybe you take damage in a firefight or something like that yeah or you can find an abandoned ship and repair it but mm-hmm. that's basically just kind of starting over mm-hmm. what they do in this game is because you're driving a really terrible uh soviet block car um is it the breaks only kind. <laughs> <laughs> it breaks down constantly and so a big part of the game is dealing with you know keeping your car refueled finding new parts to replace things that have broken down um, you know, there's, there's day-night cycles. The weather changes as you go. So you, it kind of feels, from this video that we watched, it looked like um, it'd be kind of an interesting, emergent sort of story that you have each time you take this little road trip. Um, w- would you say that this is the sort of game that if, um, for the parents out there that have kids, <laughs> they're just about to driving age, mm-hmm. you make them play this game so they understand what it's like <laughs> to have a really bad car and take care of it? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Maybe I don't know. I don't know how uh, how useful it would actually be in a practical sense. I but. just love the idea that it's in the Eastern Bloc in the '60s. Mm-hmm. And that, that's just amazing to me. Yeah, and that you know it doesn't need to have this like sort of grandiose vision of you know of eighteen quintillion worlds in order to make it appealing. It's it's very simplistic graphics. Um, it almost looks like something out of. Um, like the late '90s, early 2000s, as far as 3D graphics. Yeah, um, out of this world actually came to mind, mm. which is ironic. The the blending between it, the two games you're talking about there. Yeah, I actually kind of agree with you in terms of really more of like the tone, at least from what I could glean from it uh-huh. from the let's play that we saw. Um, I got that same sort of impression and tone from from out of this. What's world. the term I'm looking for? Ra- Ra- rasterize, yeah. rasterize, rasterize. No, that's Ra- that. rasterized is. Kind of pixelated. That's Jamaican. That's that's. That, that, I think that, that, I mean, that is Rast- Rasta. Rast- yeah, Rasta. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Rasterization is just a uh, the alternative to vectorization, but right. Um, but, well, I guess where I'm going with this is there there were really no textures on it, mm-hmm. and so I'm worried that that's just a, a pre-alpha decision they made to say, "Hey, cool, look, the gameplay's here, but we haven't put any textures in." Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering if if the sort of beauty, the simple beauty of it will be lost whenever they try to do that. Oh, I think they might be leaving it as it is. I mean, I, I haven't heard specifically one or the other, but my impression is that the the design, the, the sort of aesthetic style they have right now is very intentional. Gotcha. It, it's kind of um, a murky, not quite pastel. Um, mm-hmm. Everything's just a little bit desaturated. Um, but it's it's all, you know, kind of nice, calm colors. It's not too flashy or anything yeah. like that. Well, yeah, seems I like agree they, with that. That seems like, I mean, to me, when I saw it, too, it looks like it looked like it was made in Unity. And that they, they put on just kind of a flat material color. Mm-hmm. As opposed to actually trying to do, like we were saying. And turn textures. the lighting on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Another, but, well, yeah. another big point of emphasis in the game, which is rather unlike No Man's Sky, is that you actually have... A lot of people have described the car as being almost a character in the game. Uh-huh. Um, the car is simulated in a lot of detail. There's all these different parts that you have to worry about breaking down, or you have to... You know, if you want to pop the hood, you actually have to pull the pop-the-hood latch in the car. Mm-hmm. Um, you can store stuff in your glove compartment. 
So you have to roll down the window. Throw, throw things in your trunk. Yeah. Uh, you mean you can't just go up to the hood and, and hit the uh, press X to press X to fix things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. No, nope, you can't. You can't do that. The sound plays on clunky, 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 ding, and it's and it's done. <laughs> oh, and it's like you have you have to uh, do some button mashing to fix it. Like you know you you have a little. <laughs> oh meter yeah. I guess I guess no, my point be being terrible. though is that overall it seems like it's a pretty laid back. You're going on a trip and occasionally you run into these complications. Um, you know, you, you might sell off something you find on the side of the road and then use it to buy some supplies or some snacks or whatever the case might be. Um, but it's about it's about in a sense surviving on your way, you know, down the road in this car. Um, and you get to see some nice sights along the way. And so in a way it seems to me like it's kind of doing that no man's sky easygoing um, quote unquote exploration um, in a more interesting way. Uh, before we wrap and, this up, and I also wanna... a more easygoing way actually, because mm-hmm. it seems it seemed very kind of low key. Even though there's there's definitely tension, mm-hmm. I noticed from the from the let's play because mm-hmm. um, your car could break down at any time. Mm-hmm. It, just watching the video, it seemed like a very relaxing game. Honestly, um, I am curious about one thing, and you might know because the <laughs> let's play didn't really explain this. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you get more money? Or can you get more money? My impression is that you can sell things. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you can sell. Like I, I saw an anecdote someone shared about finding a box of uh, sausages on the side of the road, and they were able to sell that off later. Okay, so you <laughs> um, find you find things off. The that's side. terrifying. Can you? And the other, the other question that I have is, can you go off the road? That I don't know. Um, I've only ever seen people stay on the road. Apparently, there are some issues right now with like invisible walls showing up where they're not necessarily supposed to. But mm-hmm. again, pre-alpha. Um, so I'm very interested. I'm actually probably going to go check it out myself, and uh, I might report back with some impressions. Um, but I was just very intrigued when I when I saw this, and I just remembered it recently um, because of our discussions on No Man's Sky. Yeah. Uh, to give due props real quick to the uh, Let's Play that we're referring to. Sure. Let's do. <clears throat> the Let's Play we watched is from Cool Ghosts, um, and the title of the video, if you want to check it out for yourself, is Jalopy, the Best Game Ever. Um it's a, it's an interesting kind of like little look at the game. They compare it a little bit to the phenomenon of a truck simulator, mm. um, where people aren't really so interested in simulating driving a truck, but they're interested in kind of that easygoing, just you know, exploring the road sort of gameplay. Um, and this seems to do that with a really cool element of uh, emergent narrative based on the little things that happen with you and your car as you go down this procedurally generated path. And he's got a British accent, which makes it instantly cooler. <laughs> just throwing that you, out You there. automatically know he knows what he's talking about. Right, exactly. <laughs> just just like how if you have an Australian accent, it makes your nature show uh, a little more credible. <laughs> Crikey. Yeah. Uh, I do want to mention one thing in connection, and it's, it has to do with our discussion on No Man's Sky, which if you missed, it was a great episode. Go back and, and listen to that one. But um, it's the idea that a lot of people got really upset over $60 price tag for NMS, and here it's a $13 price tag, and they are openly saying, this is a pre-alpha, it is an early release, Mm -hmm. guys, this is a crappy game, but we're giving it to you right now, because, and people are loving it, Mm -hmm. 9 out of 10, you know, on their reviews, and that kind of thing, because it's cheap, Mm -hmm. and it's it knows what it is, yeah. and they're also honest about what it is. That's what I mean, <laughs> you know. And I think I think that there's a huge lesson to be learned there, yeah. Which is that you know, if you ride the long tail, you can actually make so much more money, like Minecraft did, uh, off of something that is in alpha and then in beta and then in release and then and, and actually just let it generate your revenue instead of trying to somehow fake out your uh, your players and, and your customers. Mm-hmm. Frankly, I so, agree. Anyway, I just. I felt like that was important enough to say. Thanks, Dad. (laughs) This is Wishlist, our most anticipated games that are either unreleased or we haven't had a chance to play. All right, it's been a little while since we uh, had a Wishlist segment, but I wanted to talk a little bit about a game that I'm looking forward to quite a bit, uh, Civilization VI, Sid Meier Civilization. I'm looking forward to that one, too. And that's Uh, coming soon, right? uh, Very soon. It's coming out in October. Mm. Um, I've actually already pre-ordered it, so it's it's one of those funny things. It's on my Wishlist, but I've already bought it, Mm. so... I guess it's it's on my wish list for I want to play this soon <laughs> um, because it looks really cool. Um, they're they're making some really cool updates uh, to um, sort of the systems that they've been developing through Civ Five, and I think a lot of people will agree who have played Civ Five that. Mm-hmm. For me, Civ Five was my first full experience with Civilization um, at an age that I could like really understand what I was doing. It turns out, you know, unbeknownst to me at the time, that I had played like Civ Three or something like that, but I didn't know what I was doing at all. Uh, so yeah, I put a lot of hours in Civ Five, and that was the first one that I really sit, sat down and mm-hmm. took the time to learn. Yeah, 
and dedicate some time to. Yeah, and love kids, it. I remember Civ and Civ 2. That's back when <laughs> Civ was Civ and small digital men were small digital men. I hated Civ, though, back in the day. I was too I was too busy wanting to play games like Doom. I mean, that was what I wanted to play. I'm like, what is this? What is this game? There's no demons in this game. Yeah, too sure. Forget it. Uh, but Civ 6 um, is is keeping the hex grid that Civ 5 introduced, which is very cool to me. I like that. I like the strategic implications that come with that. Um, another like little tweak that might not seem like a big deal, but it's a big one to me. Um, I always used to get frustrated in Civ 5 where certain units could stack with each other. Um, I actually prefer what they did in Civ 5 versus, say, in Civ 4, where in Civ 4 you could have just infinite stacks of however many units you wanted to have, and it was all just about like ramming your stack of mm-hmm. military into someone else's I, stack of military. That's why I, could, I couldn't get into Civ 4. I hated that whole yeah. presentation. And, and Civ 5 is much more tactical in that yeah. way, or you know, each unit's going to occupy a certain space, and you have to be strategic with your placement. Mm-hmm. Um, so are they going back to the old way? A little, no, a little so, retro there? Or so what? what they're doing is there are certain units now they can combine with each other. Uh-huh. Um, and so in Civ 5, for example, you can have a settler, and then you can move a military unit on top of the settler. It doesn't combine the units, but it just you know has it just crushes top, the so. settler. Yes, of course, into dust. Of but course. but it basically means that nobody can attack the settler directly. So it's an escort in a sense. Or you can do the same thing with trade caravans. Mm. Um, now what you can do is actually combine those units and have them move together as one. Uh, which is very nice because now I don't have to like give two separate orders to basically just like you know walk them very slowly across the land. I can say, combine this unit, you've got an escort, go here, and then kind of just let it be, uh, which is very nice. Um, they're also letting you do things like combine uh, anti-tank units with your standard infantry, um, so you can have uh, you can kind of make up for some weaknesses that one type of unit has. The other uh, very interesting development is that they're changing the way cities work. Uh, Whereas before, cities would take up a single tile. Mm. Um, Now, different things that you build in your city actually take up different tiles. And the placement of where you put those things relative to each other is actually going to affect the benefits that you get from them. Um, so for example, if you want to build a university or something like that, building them next to mountains is going to give you, um, perks, more perks than you would get if you didn't, if you put them just in an open field or something like that. I think they did, they did some of that in Civ 5, didn't they? They, they, had, familiar. they had elements of that and like they're, for example, being near mountains gives you like a science boost or yeah, you can yeah. build certain things when you have mountains adjacent. But they're just, they're really making this a core part mm-hmm. of the gameplay. They're now. making a poor, poor, uh, core part of the gameplay and they're making it so that, like, as I said, the cities now take multiple tiles. Mm-hmm. Um, so a bigger city will actually take up more of the map. Whereas a smaller city will take up less oh. than that. So That's really cool, I, actually. I, I now have a, uh, my first goal in this game, and that is to create a... Um uh, what, what do they call it? Where like the city is the entire planet? Uh, planet-sized city. Uh, what what do they call there's it? Ter- there's an actual term for that. Oh, it's a hive world, but <laughs> yeah, there's there's an actual term for that. But yeah, that's what I want to do is to create. I just want to fill the entire planet with my city. I'm ca- I'm kind of curious if that would work. Um, well, why not? You said eventually. I mean, if you can just keep. I, I'm just not sure how to what extent you can keep expanding, but it, it is something definitely to try out. Well, but if you plan out the rest of your cities, then you link them together. If they're close enough and they all expand together, <laughs> you have to plan it out. I mean, it's going to be a little complicated. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody's going to do this if it's possible. That's going to be Jim. Yeah, I'm going to try this. This sounds pretty neat. <laughs> you're going you're to make the uh, the cyberpunk. Uh, yeah, you know, planet wide. You know that there's going to be like one tile that doesn't that won't work. Like, he'll just be in the middle. It'll be the whole planet. There's, like, this one tile of, like, grass right in the middle. <laughs> right. Or we, we, we call it the reservation. Your leader can be Johnny <laughs> Mnemonic and he can go, whoa, dude. <laughs> so, I uh, don't want to spend too much time on this right now, um, because it's coming out relatively soon. I'm sure we'll give impressions. Uh, but lots of little, lots of little, um, updates, little additions. Um, for example, I'm very excited they're now updating the way diplomacy works. Uh, they're updating the way that you, uh, choose your, uh, you build up your culture and choose your, um, the way your society kind of structures itself. Um, so very, very, uh, excited to play this when it comes out. Just one more turn, right? One more turn. Yeah. It's time for War Stories. Tales of Tribulation and Triumph in Gaming. Alright, so I got a war story that kind of, uh, will set us up for our meaty topic today. Mm. And the question that's been going around in my head is... If I uh, set aside the video games for a little while, just just for a little while, will I be more creative and more productive? 
and I decided to conduct this experiment myself. It was a, a timely experiment because the semester started back up again, and uh, I have uh, a new, new, little, new little tutoring job that I'm doing for the university where I work, things like that. And so a busy schedule, it just seemed appropriate to, to set aside The Witcher 3, even though I'm enjoying it very much. Mm-hmm. And um, just try this idea of using that time to be creative and to write instead. Um, a couple of different things happened. The first is that uh, absolutely I felt more creative. I, I personally felt like that time that uh, I, I was sitting there almost kind of bored, I went, oh, I just have this desire to be creative. And, and I got in and I, I worked up on, on the treatments that I've been doing for the thing that I'm writing right now, which is kind of a fantasy piece. And uh, Man, I, I was able to get two or three chapters done, just bang, 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 and not even worry about editing or anything like that, just, just moving forward and, and blowing it out. But the the second sort of side effect of that is I actually had a friend of mine pull me aside and go, uh, this was a game night, go, uh, hey, are you okay? What's what's going on? And it was because I, I was just literally so grumpy and just so almost angry <laughs> that... Um, and it wasn't hangry, by the way. I, I ate, so I, I know it was, it was genuinely just angry. Um, he's like, you, "You're you're right, Doc. I mean, you you okay?" And I had to think about it. And I'm like, "Well, you know, it's the first semester mm-hmm. back, and then uh, our first week back in the semester." And I just kind of think about it. And, and then and I'm telling the story, and Jim goes, "It seems to me that you might actually be in withdrawal from gaming, don't you think?" And 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 this. I don't. I don't want to face that reality. <laughs> I, I just don't even want to talk about that reality. Well, uh, it, it uh, might po- be one factor among many. I don't know if that's like necessarily causing you to be grumpy, but it's maybe like one little thing that's kind of like. But I mean, gaming can be at least that has for me oftentimes been you know a source of, of stress relief. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's and there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that. People need outlets like that. That's why we have. Um, entertainment. Yeah. And, and if gaming is, is that outlet for you, then then yeah, it can certainly help your mood. Well, and I know that it is, um, at least various types of... I mean, last night, I was very much in the mood to play Zombicide. And I wanted to, to get the, the biggest, baddest, most awesome character, because there have been a couple of expansions, mm. and make sure he has double-wielded axes and just hack lo- lots of zombies. And uh, one neat sort of sub-rule uh, in that game is if you have the barbarian trait, you get to roll as many dice as there are zombies in your square. And then uh, if you dual wield, you can wear uh, you, you can roll two dice for every mm. zombie that's in your square. And so basically, I was rolling fourteen dice and just uh, one shotting like all the zombies. It was great. It was it was fantastic. Mm. Um, I nobly gave myself for the party, but um, mm. that that's only because about thirty seven stuff spawned when I kicked down a door, but. Um, <laughs> So we'll go with heroic sacrifice. Yeah, it was a heroic <laughs> sacrifice. So, I mean, well, you know, whenever they killed all that stuff later, they did it in my name, mm-hmm. um, you know. So, uh, regardless, that, there was just this this sort of visceral, therapeutic, almost kind of, uh, rawr, you know, primal lizard brain <laughs> moment um, that, that came after going basically a whole week without video games. And I know that sounds so childish, uh, but it, it really kind of felt, real to me. So uh, I'm going to continue the experiment. So if you never hear from me again, uh, it's because these guys like killed me or something in or you self-defense. Or, yeah, or you killed be. us and you, uh, so this you're is our last, in prison. It's our last show ever. And, <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, uh, quite quite literally, I, I think that it's worth, uh, it's worth testing. Mm. Um, first premise one, are you more creative whenever you don't do video games? And then second of all, um, are, are you... Are you using that as a personally therapeutic type of uh, outlet or exercise that that has become a, a part of your normal productivity? Yeah, and I would say, that at least it sounded to me, that what you got out of it was the productivity element. You were able to do be productive in your creative pursuits, mm-hmm. but you aren't necessarily more creative. You just are more productive. You actually are putting, that, putting your creativity to good use, mm-hmm. I should say. Well, that's, and that's, my, that's my impression. And that's a perfect transition into our meaty topic. Mm. And now, this week's meaty topic of discussion. All right, 
right, so I did not make this up. Um, this actually was a case study example that I used whenever I was teaching the history of video games. And um, the, the guy I want to point you to here is named Chris Melisinos. And uh, his sort of claim to fame, especially in 2011, was that he was the curator of the Art of Video Games exhibition at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Um, and... I really want to do a shout out to the Smithsonian because they have a record, let's say, of just completely standing up and saying, yes, video games are art. And and I think that that's a really cool stance that somebody like the Smithsonian uh, is taking that position because I think there's lots of games that are definitely art. Mm -hmm. and I completely agree with you. And, it, and people love will love to point out the counterexamples, but you can do the same exact thing with books and movies. That's exactly right. And so I would say, you know, is painting art? Well, yeah, the Mona Lisa is art. Painting your house is probably not. Yeah. Um, and and. That's not even what we're going to argue today. Uh, instead, we're going to go, okay, so we're just going to kind of assume that some games are art and that there's a creative process in that. Given that some video games are art, uh, here is the assertion that uh, Chris Melisinos makes. I'm going to quote him here. Quote, all video games include classic components of art. Striking visuals, a powerful narrative, a strong point of view. What's new is the role of the player. Video games are a unique form of artistic expression through what I call the three voices. The voice of the designer or artist, the voice of the game and its mechanics, and the voice of the player. A designer can craft an experience that follows a predetermined arc to set conclusion while allowing a, the player to the ability to laterally move and experience the game world. This retains the authoritative voice of the creator, yet allows each player to have a unique experience. There is no other form of media that allows for these three distinct voices to combine and present themselves as the output of expression. Wow. So my question to you is, did he get the three voices right? Specifically, uh, with the idea that the player themselves is one of the three voices. Um, now I'll start the discussion by saying that I think he's actually wrong about the second voice, the really the system. Um, yeah, I, I think that the voice, being a voice, needs to be a human. And so I think we can fix this by just going a little bit deeper and saying who creates systems? Mm. Developers. Well, I think I, I thought that was sort of the implication was that there, there's always you know the, the system is basically it's basically rules. There's right. rules for this world right. and what you can and can't do in this world. And, of course, there's design there. Someone right. someone or some ones took the time to sit down and plan out what the rules are of this world. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, it shapes what you can do in that world. So exactly. definitely I would say that as a voice. And, and I think so, too. I think that there's um, much like... If we were to use the metaphor of a film, that mm. there are three voices in a film. The first is the writer of the screenplay. The second is the director. Mm. And then the, the third would be that person who actually sits in the cutting room and edits it. Mm -hmm. So you've got the editor as the third voice. And, and if we think of ourselves as interactors with this, uh, and therefore the editor, the real-time editor, um, as a player of the video game, then I can see this idea of the voice coming through. So then the question gets us back to sort of where we started. Is playing a video game a creative act? What do you think? Well, I think part of it, because I agree with the three voices, and I agree, and certainly there are, game, there are games that have this more than others, mm -hmm. um, because some games are so linear, and what you can do is so limited, um, that you're, you have very, let's just say that you have little voice, like you can't really say a whole lot. Sure. Whereas other games, um, even games that have, you know, a set story give you so much that you can do. I mean, you're playing Witcher 3 right now. Mm -hmm. It's a massive world, huge world. You have a lot of things that you can do. Yes, there's one main storyline, but there's also within that storyline, many different ways that you can approach it, mm -hmm. different order that you can do things. And then of course there's all these side quests. Yeah. So you have, I mean, what you can do and the, the contribution that you're bringing to that game and your experience of it is massive. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing you mentioned about the system too, kind of reminds me of some stuff. Um, specifically reminds me of Raph Koster's uh, The Theory of Fun, mm -hmm. or A Theory of Fun. Mm -hmm. And he talks a little bit near the beginning of the book kind of defining what is a game and not talking about what game design is. And in a certain way, the system of a game is even more 
Like it, if you sort of simplify things down, even not necessarily to video games, but just to games in general, say chess, for example, it's all about um, what pieces you can move across, which spaces and stuff like that. Like the sort of the framework of the system, if you will, um, not necessarily kind of like what we tend to think of necessarily as gameplay. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we sort of, you know, today we're so spoiled by like all these very high production games that we're thinking like, oh yeah, narrative and art and all this different stuff. But a lot of times when, it, when the game really comes down to is what systems are we simulating and what are the moves that the player can make within the system right? Um, to achieve whatever objective it is that's been outlined. In no, and, I think, and I think that's the difference between game mechanics and gameplay. Because mm-hmm. yeah. what, we're, what we're talking about with the second voice are game mechanics. The way that the player interacts with those mecha- mechanics, that's the gameplay. Well, you see, I don't know, because I think that one could interpret that second one, if you sort of read it a little bit more literally and not with the implication that you had, which I think is a valid way to look at mm. it. But I, I, if I was reading that directly, I would think that he is talking about the game system. Mm-hmm. I think he's talking about the framework. No, I think he was, too. I mm-hmm. think the point that that's why Doc was saying it was he didn't quite agree with that, and we had that kind of... Uh, we we sort of tweaked his second voice there a little bit. Yeah, to to mean the developer, mm-hmm. the person who actually um, designs the system, designs and comes the system, up with those yeah. systems, as opposed or to the systems themselves. Does he mean the system though? I think that's a valid question to ask. Well, no, I think, I think he. That's, I think that's what we're saying. And we think he did, but mm-hmm. we disagree that that is one of the voices. In, in a way, yeah, that's a, that's a good thought. The in a way you could sort of compare it to say going to an art museum or a science museum or something like that. And we've, we've been to ones locally, I'm sure. Right. Where, right. Like here's this little thing that like draws the marker or something like that. And by like, you know, you, you push it and it starts the pendulum swinging mm-hmm. and that's what generates it. So it still required some input from the user, but the person who set that up in the first place, had the con- had the concept sets up the rig so that it's going to behave a particular way. It's just kind of the the input is what changes it, mm-hmm. and then the person who pushed the pendulum and got the marker marking things, okay. um, so it sort of created that instance of the art. But the important part there is that, and that's a very that's a pretty good comparison because I think that's a very simplified way to look at mm-hmm. um, game systems. Mm-hmm. Um, but that the artist that came up with that he knew in advance that there's going to be someone that's going to be pushing that mm-hmm. pen. Yeah. And they came up with, okay, how far can they push the pen? Mm-hmm. What sort of moves can the pen make? How much control do they have over the pen? They had to think all these things through and mm-hmm. it, it, it influenced how they designed it. I agree. Yeah. And that's sort of what's going on in games too. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, for, for something, especially something that's massive open world games like the Witcher three or like something like Grand Theft Auto five, mm-hmm. There's a lot of systems in those games that all have to interact, mm-hmm. but you, there's this understanding that players are going to be given all this freedom, and so you have to basically sort of give them an experience that sort of works within this world, and it, it doesn't overwhelm them, it doesn't it doesn't feel like it's everything gets lost. You still want them to feel to feel like they're having a singular experience, mm-hmm. like you're still playing. Like when I play The Witcher Three or I play Grand Theft Auto Five, they feel very different, even yeah. though. They're, they're both huge games in which I can do, quote, anything I want. Yeah, yeah. they're sandboxes. Yeah, I'm, right. to, I'm totally with you there. Um, and so to kind of come back around to the question that we're posing is, is playing a game an art of an act of creation? I would say that it is if we classify it more like performance art. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Because it's possible, for example, for an actor, um, that's actually one of the voices I think you might have missed in your sort of your, um, your oh, I don't, movie. Oh, I don't think you missed it at all. Mm-hmm. I do not think you don't actors, think actors are no. They're important part. They are an important part of film. But I do. I disagree that the actors are one of the voices because the actors, their voice is completely determined by the writer and the director. Oh, I don't know about that. It depends on. Well, let me, uh, I'm I'm thinking, ca- I'll caveat this. I'm thinking it depends on the director as to whether or not they have the the voice. But I think Harrison well, Ford's the perfect example here. I mean, the the classic "I know" line. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that was, that was totally him, yeah. right? I mean, the the story, and I don't know how much of it's really true, but the story is supposed to be that he was a grip, and he was giving so much advice. They were like, uh, dude, just tag in and, and, and read some lines here, and they hired him. Like I said, I don't know how true that is, but uh, you know, that's, that's sort of the legend behind where we got Han Solo from, and that he had so much creative input on his character that what we think of as being the Han Solo character is really more Harrison Ford than George Lucas. Right, but see, I would argue in that case that Harrison Ford was one of the writers or contributed to the writing of it, whereas most actors do not. Oh, I see what you're saying, So, yeah. like, when I say writer, I don't... You, you, spe- you specified the screenwriter. Mm-hmm. But really, with films, there's more than one writer. So usually. if a line gets changed... Right. 
then you become a oh, okay. you become one of the contributing forces to the writing. Maybe not the majority person, but there's there's not just the screenwriter or the scriptwriter, but you also have the person that came up with the story originally. Usually, mm-hmm. there's someone that writes the story or comes up with the concept. That's also the writer. Then there's someone that specifically writes the lines, and then there's usually someone that goes back through and will edit that script and change lines. And those lines. A lot of times it's a living script for part of production. Right, right. And people that contribute to the way those lines are, are, are written are part of that writing process. That's and true. And sometimes, depending on the actor, depending on the situation, um, the actor does get input in the writing process. But that's certainly not something that I would consider the role of the actor. Mm-hmm. That's just something that, that happens if if they have like you know that sort of input and the same thing with directing yeah. too sometimes sometimes actors will influence the directing as well mm-hmm. depending on if they cuz there's some actors that direct also and some actors that have talent towards directing and for that same reason they'll influence the, they'll they'll influence the director and how they you know shoot yeah, scenes absolutely uh, I, I recently watched inside out for the first time mm. uh, great film by the way and uh, there's a little piece at the end uh, you can, you can actually get this on Prime where it's got the special features. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a piece called The Story of the Story. And it's really fascinating how that story came about in, in its 12th or 13th or 15th iteration. It finally yeah. became that really good story. Yeah, I found that little mini documentary really fascinating. Um, yeah. Because the, the movie itself was very creative. But hearing them talk about how they came to those ideas it reminded me a lot of game design, actually. Yeah. Which is really cool. Only so. a place like Disney Pixar would be able to, to pay a bunch of people to sit around for years and <laughs> try to come up with a, with a film. <laughs> Um, but yeah, but I think also, you know, going back a little bit to the, to the acting and I, I sort of, my thought is almost more theater than film because with film, you have a, a published thing, um, that right, right. Is, is, you know, the same every time someone watches it. Right. Whereas in theater, each performance is going to be a little bit different. And I think that's for me is where you get, yeah, you don't have an editor in, mm-hmm. in theater. Yeah. That's true. Which is to me why I think to, to a, a great extent, actually the actors are, Creators. I'm sorry. Theater. Are you referring to the players? <laughs> sure, the players. Because that the is players. in fact the term that is used in the theater <laughs> for the, the actors. In the theater, <clears throat> they are the players. Yeah, I would. I would agree that theater is um, is not the same thing as a film. Yeah, so there, there is there are differences there. So there's also more to performance than just what lines you're delivering. It's how you deliver it. It's your it's your posture. It's your gesturing. I'm not arguing any of that. Timing. I have great respect for for, for actors. <laughs> yeah. I just I just don't believe that in film they are they are a voice of the film. <laughs> Um, because someone is telling them and directing them or writing them to do exactly what they're doing. I had an interesting conversation one time with Tom Riccio, who we actually had on the podcast way, way back, mm. um, because I took a playwriting class with him. And one of the things that he told us about in one of his... Um, actually, it might have been on the podcast, now I'm thinking about it. Um, he was talking about how... Um, in this particular production they're doing, it's fairly ergodic in a certain sense. You can have you have different people in different rooms, and the audience is actually moving from room to room mm. as they're sort of experiencing this play. And it's very it's very experimental, granted, but you might have times uh, where the the players are uh, not, we always just call them players, <laughs> uh, the players are in a room and there's no audience there. Um, and yet they're expected to keep acting. Say, for example, if someone happens to walk in on them, but it no, kind that's of, just silly. It kind of raises this question of what is your role as an actor, as a player? What is your role? Like, who who are you acting for? If you're only acting for an audience, does that change? the sort of performative art in a sense. Um, and so one can make the argument that even if no one's watching, and this is why this ties back into the the question of is playing a game an act of creation, even if no one's watching you play this game, I would argue, yes, you are in a performative sense creating a piece of performance art with this game. Okay, so that actually takes me to my next question. Mm. Along the lines of if a tree falls in a forest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, mm. yeah, but see, A lot of people actually do record or... Uh, right, you know, the let's play live. I, I knew that was where I was going to go, mm-hmm. but but I but I, I would I don't think we need to go that far. You don't I think we should step back here because you are you are interacting with the systems, mm-hmm. and so I think that there is interaction there. It's not. I don't think you have to add that extra step of recording yourself playing the game. Well, there's also an there. audience, and it's yourself, mm-hmm. right? And, correct. and that's that important. Is, that is correct, and 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 also you are in, you are in, there is an interaction going on between the game between the game. Very and true. You. Well, and in a meta sense, there's a wider audience too. Jim and I can talk about how we have played The Witcher, uh, even though we never played it in the same room together, and Correct. we played a completely different, call it 
playthrough or iteration. And had different experiences it despite did. playing the same game. It's like saying that, you know, I've seen Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, and you've seen Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, uh, you know, and we could talk about the differences. The first time I ever saw that play, um, Hamlet was black, which mm-hmm. was really interesting because of the, the, the sort of one-off nature of that play. It was a little disconcerting until I got used to it, and now almost similarly in my mind in Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, Hamlet's supposed to be black. And and so it's just fascinating to me, uh, you know, those kind of things can, can contribute to us. And I think it applies here too. And, and if we get back a, just a little bit to the idea of procedural games and how we're experiencing something unique within the context of the game, um, it, it really makes the unique experience, well, meaningful or unique. Mm-hmm. If if you can communicate that uniqueness and the emotion that goes along with it, I think where certain games fail, and we won't mention any names, mm. is whenever the the wonderment is lost yeah, in no, that exploration. No, I, I agree, and I think or road trip, if you can. I mean, you you have those same sort of experiences. It's not necessarily in just a um, a large simulation. You have those in open world games yeah, as you well. Do. You do all over the place, and you know, in Witcher Three or in like Grand Theft Auto or something, or you, Fallout or Fallout. You run across. You know, there's there's all these different people, different interactions. People are given, um, or the characters rather in the game are given um, rules that they live by, and then in places they might go, and they have patterns in their life and that kind of thing. And then things happen in the game, like you're like in Fallout, for example, you're running down the road and you see like someone near a town who happened to wander near the edge, and like a death claw happened to wander nearby. And the death claw, part of its rules is to attack anything that it sees, so it goes and it attacks that person, and that person's dead. Mm-hmm. And that, that's an experience that, that you might have if you were there to see it, or maybe you never saw it. Maybe it happened when you were out of sight, and you come up and you find a dead body just sitting there. Yeah. So yeah. it's like there's, there's, or maybe it doesn't happen because that person just didn't, there happened to not be a death claw when that person made that, you know, turn out near the edge of the town, mm-hmm. and is perfectly fine and alive in, like, my version of the game, but not yours. Right, exactly. Well, then it also raises the question, does this is, sorry, stupid, uh, but does the, does, do those two figures even exist if you're not within render range of it? No, well, like that simulation is not simulating the correct, entire world. Correct, and up and up to a point, yeah. It's like mm-hmm. once you get within a certain range, usually what happens is that's when those those things will kind of happen. But mm-hmm. it de- mm-hmm. it depends on the game too. Like some sometimes games will try to keep track of things behind the yeah. scenes. Yeah, it really just depends, depends on the way the game. So here's my answer to the to the question in the context of the example. Okay, let's say that it's an NPC, an important NPC, right? Um, and a part of that is that they're being attacked by raiders or this death claw or whatever it is. I fail to defend them from mm-hmm. this thing. I reload my last save and jump back in with a different weapon, prepared for what's about to happen, and actually save them from it. Mm-hmm. I have now taken on the part of the editor or the director oh, yes. or the whatever. Oh, yes. And and in some senses, that is a creative act. Mm-hmm. Uh, I spoke the other day or the, you know the other week about how um, I was actually surprised at the sex scene that was in uh, The Witcher and reloaded my game and replayed it and turned her down because I didn't want to have that uh, on my conscience as a character. Right. If you, that makes sense. You chose, like, your, your Geralt wouldn't do that. Right. My Geralt wouldn't have done that. He's holding out. Right. Uh, and, and his celibacy makes the, the later uh, encounter more meaningful or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, in that sense, that's the movie I want to watch. You know, we're talking about a nonlinear medium we're interacting well, with. Well, but that's, in, that's the story that you're telling. That's, that's the story, that, the story that, that you are telling as you play the game. Right, exactly. And so, and it's easy to kind of like have this example of, you know, anything with branching paths. It's like, okay, so I took A here and I took C here. And right. so if you sort of draw the flow chart, like my line went down this way while someone else's went down I agree. Let's, way. let's boil it down. Let's take a more mm. simplified game. Let's take let's something like Super Mario Brothers. Okay. Mm. The original Super Mario Brothers. Right, yeah. You don't even get to pick which level you go into. Like, well, yeah, you can. Warp Gates will let you do that. Correct. So that's kind of what I'm getting well, at. Let's, like how, let's, what we can do, though, but let's take like level. Let's take level. World One One. World One One. Right. Okay. So, we all have that one memorized, mm-hmm. of course. Yeah. It's it's jump and then move forward and then. <laughs> well, you see, for me, it's move forward and then jump. Oh. And herein lies, I think, where we're going with this. Right. Is that the way that you approach that level? Because there's there's several things. It's it's okay. Are you going to go straight through the level? Here's just the two basic choices. Are you going to go straight through the level? Or are you going to try to get into the um you know little underground? So you can skip ahead, you can skip a bunch of it and get right, the extra coins right. and then come up out of the out of the pipe so that you're much closer to the exit. Or are you going to stay up top? There's there's a point where you can 
um, get an extra life if you know it's there. Did you find the extra life? Did you know it's there and make sure that you pick it up before mm -hmm, you move ahead? Mm -hmm. um, there's an area where you can get a star man. Um, do you, if you're in that in that area, you're obviously going to get the star man and try to kill as many enemies as as you can, right? <laughs> or not? Are you just going to kind of stand there and like, <laughs> you know, let it run out? Or and... say you've got a goomba that's coming at you. Do you try to just jump over the goomba, and move on? Do you try to crush it? Do you try to jump up on top of a block and let it pass by you? Right. Always crush. Always crush or, your enemies. Or with um with the um the Koopa Troopas that are on the the blocks, do you try to? hit them from below and then mm -hmm. get up and then what do you mm -hmm. do with that shell? Do you just leave the shell or do you kick the shell into someone else? Right. You remember the first time that you discovered you can kick a shell and how cool that was to watch yeah. all the enemies just go bloop, 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 and if you run after it, it keeps doing mm -hmm. it and then suddenly it bounces back and you're like, oh yeah. crap! It hits a pipe and you're like, ah! And if you're really cool, you can jump on it and stop it again yeah. and then like, ah, oh, yeah. I mean, Mario. Good old and, Mario. And you know, these are single player games. I think though, you could also say, you know, you'll, Take, for instance, chess, and we mentioned chess briefly before. You can actually record all the moves made in a chess game, mm -hmm. and that record's going to look different, theoretically, than the record of the next chess game that was played. As far as player one moves, you know, rook to d6 or whatever, mm -hmm. and then player two moves, you know, king to, you know, f5. Um, even in sports, um, you know, you can sort of, you can look at a baseball game and look and see um, so-and-so, we switched to this pitcher. This is the batter that came up. Uh, pitch one was a ball. Pitch two was a strike. Pitch three was a strike. Pitch four was a ball. Okay, it was a hit. It was out. You know, that sort of See, thing. But I, I think we're getting... Yeah, I think we're getting but too far off track the, here. My, with the sports, point, I don't yeah. think... Well, the point I'm trying to make is the sports are a game. And they have... Yeah, with a human the, element. Yes, but there... And also, that's not a video game. What it's an makes, open system. Right. What makes the video game, these these three and this three-voice concept, and, and the reason that he's comparing it to, or we, we compared it to something like film, is because... There's a story there, and you as a player, your voice, you're telling part of that story as you play. When people are playing a sport, they're not telling a story. Well, there's that, not, there's I would not argue a story that the there. game itself becomes a story. Well, you can, you can tell a story about the game, but the game is not a story. And the same thing with chess. Chess is not, that is not a story. You are playing, you are playing a game, it's, it is a, it's competitive, you're playing against someone else. That is not a story. When you play tennis against someone, one-on-one, -on -one, well, there's a that story. That's not a story. There, you can you can tell there's a story, a story about surrounding that, it, though. But that might, that's, if you that, want to. Well, you see, that's the same thing that I'd argue with games because when it comes down to it, I when you're but, playing yeah, I it, when you're that. playing the game, you are executing mechanics within a system, and everything else that surrounds it is just context that we put into the game to give that context. But that's part of the game. That con yeah. that's that's and, the voice that we're talking the story about. That's the third voice. The story surrounding sports is part of the game too. But it's not though. It, it directly the story, the, the story surrounding sports, like all the, the movies that we see about sports and the analysis that we do about sports, that isn't the sport. That's the analysis. That's, or that's right. the documentary. That's, the, that's well, not plus the, sport the audience itself. for the sport is not the contributor to the sport. As much as we right. think the color of our jersey and painting our face blue actually contributes it, to it the doesn't, score, it doesn't do it anything. Doesn't. And and that's the difference here is that we, as the audience, sometimes the only audience member who's ever going to see the decision we're making, is the one who is actualizing that decision. I'll, and I'll that, concede that's... the point. That what well, you have this different between say games that you're playing competitively, like say sports, chess, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. and video games. The video games are self-contained artifact, mm -hmm. right? And so, in that sense, I can see where you're coming from. But I would argue that there are some parallels to be drawn with games that we play that aren't necessarily video games. I think we can concede that one, especially in the realm of some, like board some games, games and stuff. Yeah, but, some games, sure. I just I was I was picking on chess because I, I do not think chess would fit in this particular Chess is interesting because it's actually a closed system. It just right. has so many variables that mm -hmm. um you but, know it, it it's still worth playing. Yeah. I mean I would say something like, for example, if you were playing um, any sort of tabletop RPG, most definitely that's like that is a creative act. Yeah. But I don't think that that's what we're talking about just because I don't think anyone would argue that, would argue mm -hmm. against that, that being a creative act. Whereas playing a video game, most people, w well, a lot of people would just because there's that, there's that impression that, oh, you're not actually, you're just playing it. You're not really in control. Like if, when you play a tabletop RPG, you are that character and you have 100% control over what mm -hmm. you're doing. Mm -hmm. Even though you're, you're playing, you're role playing and you, sort of impose on yourself rules about what your character can and can't do. Those rules are all in your head. You can you can do anything. I mean, obviously, 
And you have a referee. Yeah, you have a referee that's like <laughs> that's you can't you can't do something. So in like, a way, a tabletop RPG is actually closer to a sport than a video no, game. No, let's is. not go back oh, here. Oh dear, don't make it kick you under the table. Not, <laughs> completely not true. No, and it's not well, a re- it's not a referee. That that is the designer of the world. That is that is basically the the arbiter of the rules. That's not the same thing. This is this is a this is a. What? What are you laughing about? Or something? No, I, d- I just I I failed to I see what you're saying, but I just failed to see how. Because ah, again, it's all of, it goes back to story, Chris. There is no story with those people that are, like if, if people that are there, playing sports are not telling a story. They're trying to they're trying to win that game. So not even necessarily to sports, but say chess. There's still an implied story in those. There's a context given to you by the sort of medieval thing of here are my here's my courts and here are my pawns, and I'm trying to overtake the other king. There's that, a player there's, experience. But yeah, I wouldn't that's, call it a story. No, I, I yeah, I, I, and exactly. I, I agree that it's not a story in the same way that we have in certain video games. But there are plenty of video games too that don't have a story it's purely just a system but but maybe a few of them but the ones that we even talking about something simple like super mario brothers it has a story it has a very clear story and then yeah. in world one one my story of what how mario approached that level will be different for both of y'all's story and that's the point that we're making that's my voice the way that i play mario might be i'm going to kill every single which is, are you willing to, to accept that there are some video games that are multiplayer that still have what you're looking for. Because to me, it almost sounds like you're saying only single player games can have stories in this way. Oh no, I would think no, that it I, changes I, not necessarily when you add a that. voice, right? I think I think it does change it when you have character uh, player interaction. But yeah, for sure, something like an MMORPG, well, um, say, I think, would fit into this category. Say you go back to something like Galaga, where any story that's there is only there on the side of the arcade box, or it's in a manual, or whatever the case might be. I would argue the same thing could apply to chess. But but like I said, though, but I'm not talking about... Go back to Super Mario World 1-1. Throw the manual out. Throw out the context of trying to save the princess. Literally play just that one level that has a story. That's mm-hmm. what I'm saying. So and yes, saying Galio that, would have a story, too. And I'm saying that a game of chess has a story in that same way. But you it make doesn't. moves and you react you're make, to... You're making moves, Chris, but these, are not, these, aren't, these aren't actual, like, things. They're just... Little little wooden pieces that have specific rules that you are in control of, and you're playing against another person. Yeah, right? the other person is filling in the role of the AI. We may be stretching. Uh, the, I really the think we're stretching here. it. I really think that we're stretching it. Well, we, way we too asked, far. We asked a very philosophical question, and that's we, we did. That's true. But uh, remember, so you're saying playing chess is a creative act. I just want to yeah. get one record here. Yeah, playing saying, chess is a creative act. Interesting. So, if, so if, someone and, that plays chess is an artist. I would I would actually agree with that in a performative <laughs> art sense. Yes. They're not performing for anyone. They're yeah, trying to win the freaking game. Nor man. are you performing for someone when you're playing Mario by yourself. Like I your said, room. you're interacting with the system. Yeah, you're per- interacting with the system in chess too. No, I, you're I playing actually, against another person. I actually think Chris may have convinced me on this one, but I do want to point out that Melisinos did not use the word story anywhere in mm. the quote that I read. What he said was that it is a powerful and unique form of artistic expression through three voices. So he didn't say three artists and he didn't th- say three writers. He said Fair three enough. voices. So let's, let's go back to the artistic expression element because I mean I think that's definitely something that you can say like like the different experiences in mm-hmm. Super Mario Brothers, mm-hmm. the way that you interact with the game, you are expressing yourself mm-hmm. in this game world with the systems. Mm-hmm. Right. So, well, but according to Chris, literally everything is artistic expression. Because if we're going to talk, if we're, is there anything that does not count as artistic expression that, that's when at you this very, point? Because that seems like what you're getting to. Well, there's also the question of what is art. And you could argue that anything that claims to be art is inherently art. Yes, but only a dumbass would make that argument. Because that's absurd. <laughs> <laughs> really, you don't, you don't even believe. You, even when oh, you said it, you're really. like... You're, as you say it, you know that it's not true. Well, no, actually, I mean, like, I've done a lot of thought about this in aesthetic studies, and... Just because someone does, says does something it, is, is something doesn't make it that it, something. That's absurd. It doesn't mean it's good. It doesn't mean it's going to be appreciated as art. But I would argue that anything that someone sets out and calls it art is art. And I completely, the disagree, sense of the I completely disagree. Well, we're going to have to agree to disagree. I'm completely sorry. disagree. <laughs> so who are the three voices in chess? How about that? Whoever designed chess, mm-hmm. the systems in chess, mm-hmm. which is com- which comes from the designer, and then the players. Interesting. See, by that criteria, then, if we're willing to accept that there are three voices in video games and that that is artistic expression or, in, I don't in our case, it's creativity. A, but it's not artistic expression because there are three voices. I don't think that's what he's saying. He's, no? just, saying the, he's just saying these are the three voices 
that contribute to the artistic expression of playing a video game. Ah, uh, but that's what that I think he said. That doesn't mean that it it is artistic expression because it has three voices. Right. I don't think that that's the argument okay. that there are three voices. Therefore, anything with three voices is artistic expression. I don't think that's what he's saying. That doesn't I, make any sense. I would agree. I, mean, with you. I, I, I think that that's a, that's too absolutionist. Or, like I think if we if we take it this way, you're, we're basically taking it into the direction of literally everything is artistic expression. Then there's no point in even talking about anything because if you're like, well, anything's art. If someone just says it's art, well, okay, then there's no reason to ever discuss art. Period. Because everything's art. It's just it just makes the whole thing pointless. You just get into nihilism, and then what does it matter? Nothing. nothing matters. <laughs> well, what if we, seriously? What if we do? De- that, that's a much much deeper conversation. But that's yeah, no basically kidding. what we're doing here. It's like. Let's, you know, that shoe is art, guys. There it is. Well, yeah. Just the way that shoe is placed. You see how it's, instead of it, both of them being uh, set with the soles down, <laughs> one of them ha- is off to the side. Well, you see, what you just did, though, is by calling those shoes art, you made us consider it. And no! You that, shouldn't have been considerate. You should have gone, Jim, well, you're, you're an idiot. What you, the hell are you talking you about? You framed it that way, though, and that made us consider those shoes as art. Well, maybe my bullshit was the art. <laughs> Certainly not those shoes. Now there's, now there's something to be asked about authorial intent, what it was you were trying to do with that. Right. But that doesn't mean that what you just did there doesn't make that art. Actually, what he was trying to do was be sarcastic. And <laughs> yes, uh, in, in, well, in that, in that the, sense, he was an artist. The, and right. did, That's uh, what I'm succeed. saying. The, the, the sarcastic comment, you, maybe that was art. But... Just pointing at something and going, that's art, doesn't make that something <laughs> okay, art. Okay, well, so the person who dropped those shoes there didn't call them art. That was me, by the way, and so... Uh, <laughs> but if I if I take my shoe off... No, no, no. I'm here. taking my shoe off. Here, you can't I'll... see it. I'm dropping the shoe. That is art. I'm saying that's art. Well, what'd you do with my art piece? <laughs> I just... You know, I, 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 I kicked the shoe slightly. Now, oh, now I, now I had some intent. That's not art. And you taking your shoe off is not art. Because when, when you do that, you're basically... You're taking a giant crap... On actual art, because you're basically <laughs> saying you're you're boiling everything down to crap, because anything could be art. And yet he did it within the context of a published podcast, and <laughs> was <laughs> discussing, discussing the nature of art. And so, and this is something that happens in the art world. People talked about, you know, say uh, Duchamp's uh, The Fountain. Mm-hmm. That was asking what is art. And yeah. people today consider it clearly to be art, but there are so many critics at the time who said Duchamp's Fountain was not art. This is just a urinal that someone else made that he put on display. Right. Right. And it's also not art. You can believe that. You, that everyone's entitled to their opinion. That's part of art is that different people react to things in different ways. Yeah. But I, what I'm saying is if you look at it in like the strictest definitions by most, you know, kind of like art academics... Um, point that's of view. not strictest definition. That is the broadest definition. Saying that anything is art is not a strict definition. That's the broadest so may- possible definition. Maybe I'm misusing the word strict then, but you see, for me, like the broad definition is also kind of the technical definition. It's like technically this can be considered art. Saying technically anything can be art makes the entire label meaningless. I said though it has to have authorial intent. That someone has to call it art for it to be art. That's not authorial intent though. That's just you calling it art. <laughs> you know, that's you see what I'm saying? That's not the same thing. You know, man. Gustave Courbet had to go through the exact same thing in 1866 whenever he painted the uh, the birth of the world, <laughs> which I highly recommend that you do not Google <laughs> while your mom is in the room. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> having said that, I, th- I think it would be really important for us to deconstruct the three voices here because this is actually suspiciously uh, a lot like the old, let's call it mm. early 90s argument of our games a narrative or our games a system. And I've actually snuck this whole thing in just so I could make this point here, which is... Uh, Whenever we say there are three voices, the first voice is that of the writer, and the second voice is that of the system. He did not actually say designer, he said system. And then the third voice solves the problem because there's a player. The first voice was designer, though. Well, the first voice was a designer, but actually writer, author. Right, right. Which is not to be confused with developer. We inserted that ourselves. Uh, It almost sounds like he's saying, oh, guys, guys, there's three voices. There's narrative, there's mechanics, and then there's player. Um, oops, have we devolved in, in this whole thing in the, in the definition, um, Oh, I think back we, to a nineteen eighties argument. We've gone way off track. Clearly, we're we're way out there. No, I, I think this was bound to happen. Honestly, if we're going to discuss, if, if we're asking a question of is this art, then we're asking a question: What is art? And this that's is, very true. And I mean, like, this is not, we haven't even gotten into like just the more general art games, art question. And I think we all agree that they are. Yeah. I think that, that is, 
I think really what I thought I thought we were going to focus on and what and we're at the point now where we should be wrapping up. But I I think that the real question is for the player, you as the player, like is playing that game an act of creative expression? That's kind of what it boils down. I say to, it correct? is, and I would say that. And that's what I'd like to ask, yeah. sort of, is like just to kind of see y'all's mm-hmm. thoughts. I, I, I think it is, and I think that we did kind of reach that conclusion before we sort of went off on this tangent. Before uh, we told Chris he was wrong. <laughs> I think I think we all agreed that yes, there is that sort of performative art aspect of not, but, but not performative. See, that's the thing. I think you, you're you're adding that to it. So, and I'm not saying that you're wrong. I'm just saying that you're adding that extra element of oh yeah, it's performative, and that's why you went off on this long track about sports and mm-hmm. chess. And we we never at, we never said that. We never that was not part of it. It's it's is it is you play you are playing a game is that a creative act are you is that an act of artistic expression it has nothing to do with the performance of it i would just, say the act itself not necessarily but if you take the act as a part of a whole of uh, this is this iteration of this game well yeah i mean that's but that's part of the game though you so it's, have it's to. A creative, I, don't, I don't think you can pull it it's apart a creative from act it. in that you have to perform that act in order to create that iteration well yeah the playing the game is you're performing an act, but I would not consider it a performance. I think that's, you know what I'm saying? Sure. I mean, that's 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 arguing semantics. No, no, no. But like, if you say, I mean, I, I you're, pl- you're playing with words when you go, okay, well, you're performing the act of playing a game. I'm performing the act of sitting in a chair. Am I? Am I? Am I giving you a performance? No. You're just playing with words. If man. someone built the chair to be sat in at an exhibit, for example, right? But we're not in an exhibit. Sure. And so, therefore, the person who made that chair wasn't intending it to be art, but the person no, 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 wait, wait, making not, the game not intending intend- it to be art. We're not talking about art, man. We were talking about like performance. Like playing a game is not a performance because there is no audience. All right, so that's, that's so Chris's that sounds, take on that it. sounds to me then like you don't think that playing a game is an act of creation. I, I think that it is a a act an act of creative expression. I do not think it is an act of well an act of creation. Sure, yeah, because you're doing something different or something new every time, and right? that's my point. But you're not. It's not a performance. You, those are two different. I, I'm, I'm not married to calling it performance. I'm calling it when you sit down to play this game, you're creating this iteration of the game. And I agree with that. There you go. Here's my take. I think that there is basically a, a finite amount of creativity that a person can have on a given day in a given hour or uh, per given week sure where sure. they sort of burn out and need to go recharge a little bit i think that the uh, the act of playing a game runs the risk depending on the game and depending on the person runs the risk of tapping out some of that creative energy reducing that creative energy as opposed to refueling and replacing and adding to that creative energy although i think it depends a, on the game too it, when you yeah say that. exactly i think it depends on the game and i think there's a, there's something to be said for simply changing your mode of creative expression for mm-hmm. a little while so that you can get back into another for me personally taking a little break from video games this week helped me to be a much more productive writer but some of that may just have simply been that i wasn't wasting time doing a thing when i could have been doing exactly. another that thing that was kind of my point <laughs> but, but i see what you're saying with you know especially a lot of these open world games that allow you you to do so many things and you can try to be really creative especially like gta yeah you can try to be really creative with what you do in gta yeah no kidding and you put a, you can put a lot of thought into it so i could sort of see where maybe you're tapping your creative energy of course we're just assuming that there's some sort of finite l- amount of creative energy i'm not so sure if that's true either. there's something to be said too though for like you know when you play gta in a certain way or you play world one one in yeah. mario a certain way there's a certain expression, even if you're not creating a, like, we, we sort of settled on the iteration of the art, but there's still a sort of creative expression in that here is my signature way of playing this game. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. So, so and, but, and yeah, and that's, and that's, but that's sort of what I was saying with, with GTA, mm-hmm. and just, I don't necessarily think that you have, like, in any given moment, maybe you can only be so creative, but I don't think that just because you're really creative in doing something in GTA, that now you can't be really creative over here in, like, the next hour. Mm-hmm. I don't think that you're burning out your creative energies. Well, I think different types of creativity. I think you could definitely make the case that if a person uh, can only be awake for like 36 hours straight or something, that, that you would have a finite number of creative hours available to you in a 96 hour period. Oh yeah. No, I I think there's, I think it's just more, there's only so much time in, in the day. 
and therefore you can only be so productive within a given day. And yeah, therefore, but that's because of the nature of, of, of being human. And, yeah. and I think some of us have, have times when we write better. I know that whenever uh, whenever my two year old is at grandma's, you know, I'm a much more productive writer mm. than whenever he's coming up and, and hitting me on the head with uh, with his magna doodle and, and going, you know, write, read, <laughs> <laughs> wanting to learn his letters. But uh, the the whole idea here behind this is: is there a finite amount of creative energy? that we uh, have and if if the answer is yes do playing video games take away from that and reduce our ability to be productively creative in another sense and uh, my argument is yeah I think that there's a danger of that happening depending on the individual and on the game yeah, I just have a hard time believing that because it just it rests on so many other factors it rests on the idea of we have a finite amount of creative energy mm-hmm. and i'm not mm-hmm. so sure that's true and i mean what's the real what is there any any studies on that or anything anyone's looked at that at all no I, i'm just basing it on how long can you actively write because um, you get these stories of guys like oh i don't know stephen king who yeah. locks himself in the in the closet for you know six weeks at a time and then comes out and he's like manuscript you know <laughs> and you don't know how true this is but um you you get you get stories of various guys who, who do this and that's not really my style mine's more to, to write the the treatment out and then you know make the maps and do other things and be creative generally and fill in the gaps but what and, if instead of playing video games you were just sitting around all day watching reality television right watching reality television is not expending any of your creative energy but you will be not productive at all doing anything creative. You're not getting any work done because you're sitting on your butt watching reality TV. Excellent question. So yeah. I, I think it's. I really think it's just a time factor. Now, again, it depends on the game to an extent. Mm-hmm. If it's something that is a, a highly creative process for mm-hmm. that game, then then I guess you could maybe make that argument. But or even just the problem solving in the game. Your your brain is more active playing a game than yeah, yeah. watching TV. Right. Right. So if it's if it's like a highly active experience. Yeah. Maybe you could just be to the point where you're you're just tired from doing something and you just don't want to Very true. think. Very true. Well, I, I think that video games have definitely made me smarter. I think that they've helped me with my you know logical skills, my problem solving mm-hmm. skills. I think so too. Um, no, Minecraft's definitely that, yeah. made me uh, more creative mm-hmm. in the sense of being able to build things and replicate things. So uh, that's not what I'm saying at all. Um, but what you know, what I am curious about is whether or not um, cutting out. You know, a huge chunk of my day uh, for video games would actually make me a better writer because I would have more creative energy. Uh, Or if that's just simply a a, a false idea and it has to do with being productive, like you're saying, and I could just as easily cut out the reality television, which, oh, I'm such a fan. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the thing is, the way you're going about it, you'll never actually know which is the answer. Yeah, you're right. I need a control group. Right. All right. So next week, uh, Doc is not going to have any uh, reality television in his. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I, that's, not what, that's not what I meant. Actually. I meant, <laughs> I meant you're not going to know if it's because it saps your creative energy or if it was because you just didn't. You had now had more time to be productive. I gotcha. You're not going to know which is the cause. You're just going to know the effect. Correlation, right, right, causation. Right. Yeah, very true. But, you know, if, if, if I truly am addicted and it makes me angry, then that's going to make me a, a worse writer anyway. So all my, certainly, all my characters will just be angry. Yeah, that's certainly possible, too. <laughs> I am interested to see how far you take it, though. <laughs> me, too. All right, I guess I guess we should probably yeah. wrap up. Well, I'd like to thank you guys for a good discussion. I know it might have sounded a little bit heated there, dear listener, but uh, that's just part of the process of uh, engaging in dialogue with people and exploring ideas. And so you're going to mm-hmm. have some good talks. And, and I, I'm also going to go ahead and declare this episode as art. Oh, excellent. Cool. Yeah. Uh, now, Chris, you, as the, as the editor, people. It's now art. As the editor of this piece, you're going to edit out the part where uh, Jim just slapped you across the face? Um, you see, because you asked that question, now we don't know whether or not it actually happened. Oh, that's Because true. Like, I could have cut it out or right. I could have left he, it unless out. Unless you edit out this conversation. Yeah, it's really confusing. Oh, wow. That's so deep. That's so deep. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us for episode number 77 of the backward compatiblecom podcast, our talk on whether or not uh, playing a game is an act of creation. Uh, I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. And we'll see you next time. We want to join your discussion because dialogue makes everyone better. Want to hear our thoughts on a particular game or topic? Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, or at our website, backward-compatible.com. And we might feature your question on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible.